The oceans are our lifeline. They're home to an industry that includes tankers and cruise liners, container ships, as well as super yachts and pleasure craft. And it's a fast-growing industry too, with twice as many vessels at sea as there were 20 years ago. A global enterprise so huge and complex needs more than just regulation, it depends on a wealth of capabilities and services. And you'll find a wealth of them represented in the Isle of Man Maritime Organisations. With a thriving business community that enjoys world-class connectivity, a favourable tax regime and a commercially aware government, the Isle of Man is an ideal place for companies of all kinds to flourish and grow. Isle of Man Maritime augments that with the dedicated service for the shipping industry that's based here, bringing private enterprise and government together in a partnership which serves the needs of its members wherever the fleet travels across the world. Employing the latest technology, maximising the flexibility of the internet, including new tools and apps developed by local companies, Isle of Man Maritime brings benefits to ships, crews and owners, and is helping to protect the biosphere on which all of us depend. Our members reap the benefits of our forward-looking philosophies, the breadth and diversity of local expertise, and they enjoy the added security of consular access worldwide, and ultimately the protection of the Royal Navy. The Isle of Man can look back on a millennium of peace and stability, though when history called, Manx sailors have always answered, from Trafalgar to Dunkirk. There was a Manxman at the helm of HMS Victory during the Battle of Trafalgar, and William Hillary built this tower in Douglas Harbour to give refuge to sailors in peril. Now, its reach extends around the UK coastline through the lifeboat RNLI service he created. We're aware of our past, proud of our heritage, but our eyes are firmly set on the future. By providing a forum to discuss ideas and opportunities, Isle of Man Maritime helps the modern maritime industry progress towards growth and development. And that ethos is attracting more and more companies to make a home here. Maritime business in Isle of Man is very important. The Isle of Man government supported the ship registry, become an international registry in 1984. And the whole purpose of the ship registry was to encourage maritime business in Isle of Man and diversify the economy. We have a thriving maritime cluster organisation which supports a diverse range of maritime economies from crewing services, corporate service providers, professional services, insurance and IT. Anything that we do in that maritime space that we can export internationally is vitally important for the economy. Isle of Man Maritime, always receptive to new ideas, adopting and adapting them into our vision of a sustainable future for our industry and our ocean lifeblood. With 400 merchant ships and 100 commercial yachts registered on the Isle of Man, there are over 9,000 people afloat under the Manx flag. Technology allows us to reach out to them in ways that have never been possible before, providing support for fitness and wellness, physical, mental and spiritual. Isle of Man Maritime has a new version of the Crew Matters app, the first crew welfare app produced by a flag state and developed by the ship registry. Free to every crew member sailing on the Isle of Man registered ships, it operates in partnership with other worldwide organisations, bringing huge experience and resources to bear. Internet streaming provides news, entertainment and dedicated religious services. The Isle of Man ship registry was the first to broadcast mass to ship owners at sea. 
And because a healthy mind requires a healthy body, there's a weekly workout streamed live from the gym at Bodycraft Fitness in the island's ancient capital at Castletown. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the second of three webinars hosted by the Isle of Man Maritime and broadcast from ELS's studio in the Isle of Man as part of London International Shipping Week. This session covers the seafarer wel welfare and well-being, a subject that has brought, been brought sharply into focus of the shipping, not only the shipping industry, but the wider community due to the travel disruption and other challenges caused by the pandemic. During this period of the last 18 months, seafarers have been literally the world's lifeline in maintaining the flow of essential goods all around the world, locally, internationally. And it is appropriate and timely to ensure that their dedication, their sacrifice is recognized and appreciated. In the backdrop drop you see behind us, just above Cameron's head, um, you'll see the Tower of Refuge, which is built on the Conister Rock in Douglas Bay. The tower was built through the determination and generosity of Sir William Hillary, founder of the RNLI, but it was built to afford shelter to stranded seafarers who, whose ships had foundered on the rock, um, and this provided salvation for them. It's a notorious hazard of shipping, and the building of the tower itself is a, a fitting symbol to the dedication of seafarer welfare and appropriate for this particular debate. My name is David Furnival. I'm the Executive Chairman of Bernard Schulte Ship Management. I'm privileged to introduce our panel. On my immediate left is Joanna Drysdale, Underwriting Services Manager of MHG Insurance, which is an independent insurance advice and solutions provider with a strong focus on maritime community and advancing the quality of life for seafarers and their families. Next to Joanna is Tyrone Dwyer. He's the Marine Manager DPA, CSO of the Isle of Man Steam Packet Company. Um, this is the principal lifeline for this island for transportation during the last 18 months, and we really needed it, without which the panelists here would be a lot thinner, I can assure you. Um, they performed stoically during that period, and we hope that uh, Tyrone would give some insight in how they've achieved that. Next to Tyrone is Cameron Mitchell, uh, director of the Isle of Man Ship Registry one of the British Red Ensign flags. Um, and an example, and I say this through personal uh, experience over many, many years, an example of how a progressive, proactive and pr professional legislative organization should operate. Again, we'll see an insight into how that's been achieved with respect to seafarer wellbeing in due course. And then joining us virtually is Kerry and Meller, who's responsible for, for seafarer wellbeing at Shell. And Shell, for those who have interaction with Shell, is one of the all majors that has set safety standards in shipping at the level which many are um, ambitious to achieve. But having set the standards, Shell are one of the few companies that have also given us the knowledge and the tools for which to achieve it. They've really shared their, their competencies and the rest of the shipping in industry who follow that um, are fortunate to get it. Behind the scenes, we have uh, Lee Clark Vorster, the General Manager of the Isle of Man Maritime, operating the controls and the Slido, um, and he will be taking messages from you, uh, which will, he'll relay to me and I'll relay to the panel. Um, Slido, you'll see the, um, hopefully the um, link on the bottom of your screen. Please do provide your feedback, pose your, uh, your questions, we'll try to give you the answers. Um, anything you can give us will help enliven the debate and make it more interesting and satisfying. And then towards the end of the session, we'll pose um, a poll question to the audience um, with a number of answers. Please select one and we'll share the uh, results at the end of the session. The webinar is, is being recorded, so anyone unable to participate live um, will be able to play it back um, once the links are available and we'll share these links uh, to you all in due course. And now we move on to the questions. And the first question that we're asking, or I'm asking the panel is, what is your organization doing to assess and manage crew well-being on board ships? A fairly straightforward question. 
And can I pose that question initially to Cameron, please? Thank you, David, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think it's fair to say it's been a challenging 18 months for everyone, including flag states. Um, meeting our international obligations as a regulator and ensuring compliance of our fleet. So, uh, challenges, yes, but moving forward, uh, we've managed to engage with our companies to try and negate crew contract lengths that were going over 12 months. We now require companies to produce repatriation plans to us if that contract period is getting extended beyond contract dates. And we've helped them to try and manage that situation. Um, we've also, uh, within the last sort of 18 months, partnered with an Isleman Maritime member, Tappet Maritime, to develop the first ever Seafair Welfare app designed by a flag state. And we've done that purely to try and help seafarers through what is a very, very difficult time at sea, especially, I would say, through extended contracts, etc. Um, we've often tried to do something to help seafarers as a flag state, but can never really come up with a solution. And I think COVID as a catalyst for change has allowed us to look at things differently. Um, through the app, we've managed to engage with industry, with third sector organisations such as ISWAN, chaplaincy services provided by Stella Maris, and all of those services have become features of the app to provide sea seafarers with something that they may need you know, as a lifeline while at sea. So we're very pleased to, with what we've done so far, but there's much more to do. And you say you're the first flag to achieve that capability? We believe so. Do you yep, think other flags will follow or your um, flag will, be, your, your op option will become universal? Uh, I hope they will. I mean, what we have decided to do is originally when we developed the app, we made it available to the 9,000 approximately 9,000 seafarers on Isle of Man ships and yachts. Recently, we've opened it out to anyone because we feel that strongly about the importance of the app and its benefits. So hopefully any seafarer in the world who feels it will benefit them, they can download it and use it for free for the, from the App Store or the uh, Google Store. Okay. Thank you, Cameron. Thank you. Uh, Tyrone, may I ask you the same question? And obviously with a <coughs> ferry op operator's hat on, you'll have significant different challenges. Now. Sure, yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, there are certain aspects of a seafarer's life that may impact negatively on their well-being. And what we try to do on board is to um, manage that as best we can. And these are just a few uh, instances of what we do in the steam packet to uh, help our seafarers uh, and uh, improve their well-being. I'll start off with the, um, the tours of duty that we have for our crews. They're uh, short. We either do a, a week on, week off, or two weeks on, two weeks off. Uh, we look at their shift patterns when they're on board working. Uh, normally the shift patterns are either 12 hours on or 12 hours off. And in some instances we operate the um, traditional four on eight off system. And this ensures that they get uh, quality rest periods on board. Uh, the crew accommodation, of course, it's maintained to a good standard and we have a new ship under construction and that will be put, built to a much higher specification. Uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing that. Uh, recreational facilities we provide for crew, um, for them to use, exercise equipment, games, books, TV, even Sky Sports. Uh, food is a big, big uh, thing as well on board ships. Uh, on board catering, we provide nutritious diet, which can influence mental as well as physical well-being. Communication, communication and key is key in our industry today. Uh, we provide facilities such as free Wi-Fi, and due to the nature of our operation, we're always nearly in phone, mobile phone range, so crews can communicate with loved ones um, wherever they may be, by whatever platform they wish. We have quality shipboard managers on board, and this ensures the welfare of our seafarers. They're encouraged to discuss their well-being, and they will not suffer any detriment or be poorly thought of if they do so. Um, we strive to get rid of what I call the, the macho culture, or a culture where harassment and bullying take place unchecked. Our company won't tolerate bullying in any form. And I suppose lastly, uh, crew composition where we aim for diversity um, without discrimination of any kind. So you draw these all together and it gives us a good, a good platform for the, 
the management of our crews while they're on duty. Mm, thank you. Yes, indeed. Um, you, you mentioned non-tolerance towards bullying, of course. Um, yeah. I, I myself have travelled on the steam packing company many times, and um, you have close contact, many of your crew, with the passengers. We do. And your, your tolerance mm. towards bullying and abuse is the same, I guess. Well, yeah, you know, there, there is the, um, the ethos that the customer is always right, and we do provide uh, a quality service uh, while on board to our customers, and we strive to always improve on that. But if you get a, a passenger that becomes aggressive or is, you know, being violent towards our, our staff, it's just not tolerated. Yeah. Um, this day has gone. You know, they're there to do a job. They, they do it as well as they can, and we'll support them in, in that all the way through. Yeah, you have a duty protection. Absolutely, yeah. yes. Thank you very much, Tyrone. Um, Joanna, from an insurance perspective, how can you... Yeah, <laughs> our core business is essentially uh, creating benefit packages for uh, maritime organisations like cruise lines and, and yachts. And we actually take the view that it's our responsibility to craft those policies in a way that looks after the crew in every facet of their, uh, of their life, not just when they're on board. Obviously, the P&I is the primary caregiver when the crew member is on board. When they're on leave, they still need to be looked after. Otherwise, they can't return to their position. So our plans cover their uh, activities that they like to. You don't have um, lots of onerous exclusions for activities. Um, lots of our plans can cover dependents. Um, and also it's important to us to make sure that we offer a plan at least that includes cover for mental health, maternity, a lot of the things that are often stripped out of insurances. Um, so we've been doing that with cruise lines and yachts for 30 years now and making some progress. We also have a keen interest in the welfare of yacht crew. Um, we think they're a bit of a forgotten population in seafarers because although it's a luxurious industry and it's very well funded. The yacht crew population are essentially very similar to that of the rest of the seafarers. You have a lot of Indonesians and Indians and Filipinos and Croatians and, you know, it's a very similar population. Um, so we had concerns about their being missed by the welfare charity organisations and we commissioned ICE1 to, to do a survey to take the temperature of the yacht crew, find out how what challenges and problems they were having. And in 2018, it actually came out that they are very vulnerable to all of the same pressures as normal seafarers. So our focus is very much now on what do we do next? How do we help yacht crew seek help when they need it? That's the next step. And do you see any traction on the normal merchant, merchant ship crew, the tanker crews, the uh, container ship crews? We have a... We have a fair bit of um, business from them. We tend to focus on um, year-round private medical in the Isle of Man, and that tends not to be the kind of thing that the commercial ship operators are after. We are very experienced in crafting, customising plans to suit absolutely every scenario. So if we were to get more interest in that, we would certainly be very happy to help. OK. Maybe you're getting your message across to the audience. Thank you very much, Joanna. Um, can I move to Kerryon, please? Um, can we have your perspective on, on this? Sure, um, I, and I, I guess I'd take the question in, in two parts and start with the, how are we managing crew wellbeing? Because I've heard some great things from the panel already. Um, you know, that holistic approach to wellbeing, uh, whether that's ensuring your policies, your bullying, harassment, diversity, inclusion, um, are all fundamental to ensuring the welfare of your crew. Having an employee value proposition where people feel valued, um, where they can see development and actually, you know, how how they fit into a company organisation. Um, your terms and conditions, the uh, the responsibility that people have, assuming of course you're not giving them too much so that they're under too much pressure. But you know, that's a different different conversation. Um, I think when it comes to managing, you know, COVID has shone a spotlight on this. We always provided internet. But, you know, ensuring there was sufficient bandwidth to be able to communicate with home, um, the gym, accommodation, food, social activities, you know, that's all part of that, that package of making sure that people feel as much of a home away from home as they can, especially given the extended periods they, they've been on board. Um, 
and, and it's been busy. I, I think COVID has allowed us to use technology to perhaps look at some pinch points where perhaps we would normally go on board in port. We've been able to do virtual visits, allowing them a bit more freedom to, to just focus on the job in hand uh, and allow us to make sure that we're making that good, transparent and authentic conversation between ship and shore at, at other times when they've actually got time to talk to us. So the question then, of course, is, well, how do we assess if what we're doing is is right? Um, and, I, and I think we should step back one and, and look at the factors that actually influence well-being. Uh, a couple of years back, Shell uh, undertook research with the Institute of Employment Studies um, and identified key factors that influence well-being uh, from which we took sort of six themes. So no surprises, leadership, uh, teamwork, the environment, uh, the actual role itself. Um, the advocacy, so we as an industry, how we impact well, well-being on board, um, and the team itself. I think everybody on the panel will recognise that socialisation and how a team interacts on board um, can have a huge impact on, on crew well-being. And from that research, we then began to develop programmes, which I, I guess we'll touch more on uh, along with maritimewellbeing.com when we talk about how we could improve going forward. So sticking with the, the assessment um, during our, our partners and safety conferences this year, we began thinking, well, each company is in a different place. This is a journey. We've all focused on different things in the past. We've all put our money and our efforts and our, our uh, influence into particular key areas. So we need to do a situational analysis looking at the leadership. So is it visible? Uh, do people actually truly believe what's being put in front of them? And do the leaders really understand how people on board the ship feel? Are they actually seeing those policies? Do they actually recognise that um, we will stand by the, the policies we have in place, place and, and that they can trust us to do that? Um, then looking at the sort of foundations behind all, all the different well-being, what, what's our priorities? And what resources are already there? And from that, you can then assess, OK, so what are the gaps we now need to, to, to field? And I think as part of that, we worked with a, a startup from Denmark um, who have developed a product that you plug into your Wi-Fi. Very, very simple. And I think that's the, the brilliance of it. A bit like when you go to Gatwick and you press the little smiley face or the, the sad face, depending on what kind of service you've had. They have a set of questions that are based in human factors, uh, be it around fatigue, be it around um, are you mentally or physically exhausted after work, um, so that we can start to dig into the trends and themes of how people are really feeling on the front line. And ultimately, the front line know what's best for them. We sit in our offices and we, we like to help and support them, but the reality is they know what the challenges are on their ship. And so to hear it from the front line and then pass those trends back to the vessel to, to allow them to consider what was it that made us feel that way? What is it we can do to resolve this? What help do we need to do that? So I think um, we still a lot of work to do, but that's kind of the place we're in at the moment, looking at uh, assessing how we're doing with crew wellbeing. Yeah, thank you, Kerry. That's very comprehensive indeed. Um, uh, not otherwise to be expected from Shell, of course. And um, I have to say, um, from, uh, from, with my BSM hat on, we followed um, Shell's partnership in safety for many years. And um, I partook in the Visible Leadership um, Programme. I went on board ships as recommended, talking to the crew, the ratings, the junior officers, cadets, not only the master and chief engineer. And it's remarkable what you find out about what's going on when you make the effort to do that. And you're quite right, unless we really know what's happening on the front line, we'll never be in a position to make correct management decisions to, to optimise it. Thank you very much. Um, there is a supplementary question to question one, which is about whether or not COVID exacerbated the situation. I think it's pretty clear it exacerbated the welfare issue. But I think talking to you all, it's also clear that it's accelerated the solutions, finding the solutions. Um, so I won't, I won't repeat that question. I don't think that's necessary at the moment. What I will do, though, is bring in an anonymous um, delegates question, which I think will go to Joanna. Um, you'll see fairly obviously why. And the question is, why do insurers apply a low limit on the cover for many mental health treatments and exclude treatment for some mental health illness and related injury? I think the answer is basically it's an outdated attitude. I don't think there's a good... Um, there's a sound underwriting reason for that. Um, certainly our experience on our yacht and cruise line products is that the, the mental health benefits that are there are not really used. 
So you can't argue that there's been abuse or um, overuse of the benefits. I think it's just that some underwriters are still using old policy wordings and their clients just need to push them to say, this is an important thing to us. Um, and we don't think it's going to cost very much more, but please include it in our coverage. And, and as a solution provider for insurance issues, you can help Definitely. clients with that. Yep. We, are, we are pushing our insurer part partners who are very well versed in the maritime industry already. We are certainly pushing them to remove barriers to mental health uh, treatment, for example, lowering um, deductibles and co-pays or removing them altogether. Um, increasing limits or removing the limits so that it's treated like any other illness because after all it is like any other illness mental health is health um there, yeah there's no there's no good reason is the answer <laughs> okay good so we've got to find out solutions to overcome that uh, that rather old-fashioned approach yeah it'll happen yeah it'll, it'll happen, definitely yeah. happen yeah okay great so we'll move on to the second question and i'll take it in the same order if that's okay um because it is a, a follow-up of the first, obviously. Uh, and the question is, what are your key objectives to improve the status? Cameron. Um, I think there's, you know, we have short, medium and long-term goals, I suppose, at the ship ready, just like every other organization. Um, in the short to medium term, we want to continue to develop the app to make it more engaging to seafarers, to make it more interactive to seafarers. So it's things that you can do together as a crew on board rather than the things you would do individually in your cabin. Obviously, there is things on there that are, are personal, and you may want to do them by yourself, things like the, the well-being courses. That might be something that you don't want to share with others, and that's perfectly understandable. But I think we've got to keep moving forward. I think the, the objectives, the main objectives, and what would improve the status most of all is getting good broadband winds on board ships, good Wi-Fi connection, connection for everybody on board ships. And you know, we've seen it amongst our fleet, amongst our owners and operators, the demand for bad bandwidth now on board is massive. Um, now, to me, and I, this may be a very simplistic view, I'll grant you, but if we're developing smart ships, intelligent ships, more and more data analytics, more and more bandwidth required, to me it would seem obvious that you'd have some of that bandwidth available for crew on board ships and order them for them to use apps to be more engaged, more connected to ship to shore, I suppose, as, as has been mentioned before. Um, I think we have to have that mindset change that just because you're a seafarer doesn't mean you shouldn't be entitled to something. You know, if you've got 24-7 Wi-Fi at home, in the community, in a coffee shop, why wouldn't you be able to get it on board a ship? So we're, we're isolating them by putting them in that position, is what I, what I would say currently. And that isn't every company, but there's some very good statistics out there that have been talked about this week, I think, at the Inmarsat conference in London. And the actual percentage of seafarers that have free access to Wi-Fi on board would shock you, actually. It probably wouldn't, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, having looked into this uh, ourselves on many occasions, and we're a company that's going digital, and, and we have to, at the same time, provide the, the communication bandwidth for, on which the, the crew will benefit, for sure. Thanks. I entirely agree with you. Um, Tyrone, can I pose the same question to you, please? Yeah, um, again, probably to reiterate a bit more or less what Cameron said, uh, communication is key. Um, but this I'll take it from a slightly different angle. Uh, we continue to communicate with our vessels uh, through seafarer sea safety meetings um, uh, to discuss about their, their well-being. Um, and it has been at the topic of uh, a number of discussions on board and uh, the company have always addressed uh, these issues raised through the safety meetings. Uh, communication with uh, the shore managers and shore management. Um, our management team uh, are probably on board one of our vessels or both vessels uh, on a daily basis, and we're always willing to take the time to talk to any crew member, um, and if they have an issue, we'll, we'll sit down and talk, to talk it out with them and see if we can address it there and then, or if not, go back and, and make inquiries about it. Uh, another issue that we've in recently introduced is we've uh, included a master in our weekly shore-based management meetings. This gives the whole management team um, a further insight and the masters can bring that to the table as to suggestions and improvements um, for seafarers' well-being on board. And we do take that seriously and, 
and uh, it's acted upon. Um, again, we have a very good and reliable, dependable HR department, and they're available 24-7. Uh, any seafarer is able to contact them if they have an issue uh, with regards to their well-being or for their shipmates' well-being, for that matter. And uh, finally, I suppose we reserve the services of a, a counsellor um, that is available to any of our seafarers should they wish to maybe discuss an issue out with the company. We, we provide that source for them. So again, um, communication is key. Um, as you say, you have the, the technology side of communication, but you've also got the face-to-face. -face, and as our operation permits us to do, we can do that. Okay, all progressive stuff um, and good to hear. Thank you very much, Simon. Joanna, how can insurance, um, or your company in particular, um, help CFO well-being in the future? I gave a bit of a spoiler to that answer when I answered the question earlier. Yep. I do think that um, there should be more of a holistic approach to health, as in we shouldn't be separating off mental health actually in maternity as um, aberrations. They should be part of um, seafarer health altogether. So no sublimits, no deductibles, well, lower deductibles, those kind of things. I also think it's important for um, ship owners and managers to understand that while a lot of seafarers have cover in their home country under the social system, it's actually quite difficult for them to access it in the time frame that they need to. So uh, the waiting list for NHS treatment in the UK is quite horrifying. Even in, a, in an acute situation, you can often be waiting for a, a routine appointment for months on end, which of course is no use for a seafarer. So you, you, and obviously we know this because we speak to seafarers every day about their personal issues. Um, so there should be more thought given to how can, how can we enable our seafarers to actually access the help that they need. Um, that one way can be purchasing private medical or vacation medical. Another way could be uh, making sure your seafarers know for example, about the Dreadnought Medical Service in the UK, which is part of the NHS and prioritises seafarers for medical help. Um, it's funded partly, I think, by charitable donations, so your companies can assist by funding that. And I'm sure there are other organisations which are similar in other countries. So I think these things are important. It's not all about insurance. Um, it's also about just ensuring your employees have access so that they are on a par as required by MLC, with the shoreside workers. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, and then to carry in um, for your view on the future objectives of Shell. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, and some great things that we would would emulate that I've I've also heard from the panel there and Joanna's point about you know it's a holistic approach to to health that we need. Um, uh, I think what we're really talking about here though is behavioral and cultural change it's, it's a shift from where we have been to where we need to go um, so we're really focusing on how do we promote good health physical and mental um, protect folk from illness you know be that improvements to uh, the ability to uh, get good rest um, environmental improvements such as noise vibrations etc can all contribute to that so there's focus needed on a sort of technical level as well um, and also provide timely access to quality support. Um, we've heard mention of ISWAN today, but there's a lot of resources out there. And frankly, it's quite confusing, both for the individual and for the company who doesn't know where to start, um, because there is a lot, but it's, it's not consistent. So our key objectives really are to help uh, not only ourselves, but also industry find a way to continue breaking down stigma um, and building resilience. I think most people are probably well aware of the Shell Resilience Programme, perhaps not so well aware of uh, MaritimeWellbeing.com, which was based on the factors I, I mentioned earlier, but is short programmes that seafarers can use themselves to really learn from each other. The intent with these programmes was to help guide um, uh, ship owners, ship managers with what may be best practice in how to set up professional care provision or look at how they may set up a championing network like we used to do with safety. Um, but also for the actual individual seafarer to be able to do something hands on where they could learn not only some facts, but also from the, exper uh, the experiences of, the, of their colleagues. And through that, to uh, be able to uh, 
be as resilient as possible in the situations that they find themselves. I think the final part of that, of course, is then working with the likes of the panel uh, today and the cross industry, be it through the different sectors, cruise, barge, yacht, um, but also the shipshore interface, you know, the ports and terminals, so that we're all giving a consistent message with consistent language uh, and really moving on together with this and influencing the industry to take that step forward, to shift that culture and to bring about some tangible change, not just because there's a pandemic on, we need to use that momentum to, to really push forward with supporting our seafarers. Okay, th thank you, uh, Karen. Can I, can I ask you um, the supplementary question that I have here? And that is, uh, how do you empower your staff to actually speak out about wellbeing issues, mental health issues? It's always been That's a taboo, a taboo subject ashore. I, I know from my sea time, it's something we never talked about. What's Shell's view on that? I think it's a really great question. And we th sometimes think we're further along with that than we actually are. Um, I have experienced just this week of somebody saying to me, you, you can't tell from my face that I'm not well, right? Um, which says it all really. And that somebody who's well educated would happily say, yes, it's okay not to be okay. But the reality of when they're not well themselves, they still don't want to talk about it and they don't want people to know. So I think we've a lot of work to do. Um, and I think it starts with education. It starts with awareness uh, of what the challenges are and, and why we don't uh, talk about uh, mental health in particular. Um, and I think what you'll hear from Shell going forward is a, is a much deeper conversation around safety to speak up, um, failing safety, psychological safety. So actually creating an environment for our seafarers on board where they trust um, that it's okay to speak up because at this time we still have a punitive culture. Um, the, there's a reticence to admit mistakes, a, a reticence uh, to admit that maybe you're not well, perhaps in fear of what that will mean for your career. Um, and so we've, we've a long way to go to break that down chunk by chunk, I think. I think one of the things that does help though is, is for example, this, this anonymous uh, feedback system we have on board uh, using the Startup Scout base, um, where people feel they can contribute and can speak up uh, more so than before um, because nobody knows who's talking. Um, but again, it's going to be a multifaceted approach to breaking down stigma and we all need to be consistent in the messages we're giving. Yeah, absolutely. Fully agree with you. Thanks very much for that feedback. And Tyrone, as the other ship operator within the panel, yeah. um, is that something similar you have, uh, a similar approach you have in the steam packet? Um, yeah, if seafarers don't feel that they can discuss matters with their colleagues or report safety concerns, it can negatively affect their mental well-being. And we encourage openness at all levels on board. Uh, our safety meetings, again, are one way to openly discuss these things. And um, the companies always encourage crews to openly um, discuss any issues and to report them to us to be um, investigated and acted upon. Um, as I said before, our management team are frequently on board and we will always take the time to talk to anyone. Um, yeah, but it's a case of, I suppose, education as well, gaining seafarers' trust, um, a combination of these things, as Kieran said. So, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, and then the, the second component to the question, the supplementary component, is do organisations place enough importance on the need for mentoring and for being mentored? And, and the reason why I included this was because in my experience, we see a tendency of senior officers to expect their junior officers to be fully trained, uh, fully experienced, and don't really appreciate that they have a role in that career progression. Um, and we have to try to persuade them that it's important, that it's valued, and that all, all individuals themselves should take the value of being mentored as well. So it's a two-way it's a two -way street. Um, Cameron, can, can I ask your opinion on that? Yeah, I mean, um, I think... Uh, from my view, I think we don't provide necessarily enough soft skills at training level. So that's within the colleges, the establishments provide provide officer qualifications or yacht crew qual qualifications. They're very much uh, um, learn the skills, pass the exam, get out the door. And I think that that's traditionally the way it's been done. So we're not teaching those people as they go through how to be good managers, how to be good mentors, how to be good coaches or life coaches. So that problem just exasperates. So as you go 
goes on board the ship, you have the same situation. Um, I know there is a lot of companies now who have started to invest in management type courses for their senior officers or even at sort of um, second officer level on board the ship to try and progress their careers away from sea and back to shoreside jobs. But without carrying out those qualifications or that training, that soft skill approach earlier, I think we're going to continue to have these issues on, on board ship. Okay. I don't want to um, elaborate too much on that particular question. We have another um, anonymous a delegate question I'd like to introduce, which does link into the third question quite well. And the question is, linked to the earlier discussion regarding digital maritime, what can flag states do to encourage companies to provide free, low-cost internet access for seafarers at sea? Now, that's a, a tough question, but I'm going to have to level it at you, Cameron. <laughs> Thank you. What influence do you, do you have? I mean, I think that the starting point for all of these things is is, as I see it, through the international bodies responsible. So in this case, I would consider that the International Labour Organization and the Maritime Labour Convention is a good place to start. If it's deemed that free access to Wi-Fi on board ships should be a right that seafarers are entitled to, then that's the regulatory route that it would go down, as I see it. Um, do flag states influence that? Yes, they can. Um, for us, for members of the Red Ensign Group, the parent body, if you like, or the, the flag state is uh, the MCA in the UK. Um, and if the Red Ensign Group members believe strongly enough that this is something that we would want on board all our ships, then we can present that to them. But ultimately, it's their decision and their decision if they want to take it to ILO. And as you know, ILO is a tripartite arrangement. So we have ship owners and operators, you have the flag states, you have the bodies that are all involved. So. It, it, all of these things take quite a lot of agreement, shall we say, before they can come into place. But that's how we'd have to do it. I can't, as a flag state, regulate Wi-Fi on board our ships no, you individually. Can't. That, that's pretty clear. Mm. Uh, my, own, my own opinion is the reality is that the, um, the crewing crisis, the lack of qualified, motivated crew, crew in the world, will drive the need to provide these facilities mm which the crew expect to have. You know, that's the reality of it. And, and ship owners, operators who don't invest in that mm. connectivity will, will suffer because um, they'll have lower retention rates. If I can come back in on that one, I think there was a very good survey done. I think it was by Nautilus International. I think it was 2018, and I'm happy to be corrected on that, where they looked at um, those fundamental factors that would encourage a seafarer to go back to sea with a particular company. And I think... 70, I think this was it, 75 percent of seafarers said access to Wi-Fi would be a deciding factor in their next contract. So if that's 75 percent of everyone that responded, that's a fairly substantial figure. Fairly substantial, absolutely. Okay, can I then lead on to the third question, which is um, similar in nature, and that is, what can the maritime training academies, training providers, um, private shipping entities um, and NGOs? Uh, do to support your organisation objectives on seafarer welfare and well-being. Uh, Tyrone, can I ask you to respond, please? Sure. Um, well, we're, we're quite a small organisation, as, as you know, but there are a number of factors. Um, and I think that this starts at school, actually, with school leavers and career guidance. Um, uh, choosing a career at sea can be rewarding in many different ways, but it's obviously different from working ashore for a number of different reasons. Um, educating potential candidates about the pros and cons of such a career can help, help them make informed decisions um, whether to even go there in the first place. I think that's, that's the starting point. Um, again, if they do decide to go ahead uh, with the college, um, you know, the, the training organisations, um, they make their application and there's a, a sifting, processing, assessing if they're um, shall we say, predisposed to a, a career at sea. I think that's an important thing. The last thing you want to do is um, have a, for instance, a cadet that goes to college for a year, um, is in there, does well in college, comes to sea and decides this is not the life for me. It's a waste of the college's time, the seafarer's time, and um, you know the, the, um, he's, he's wasted a year of his life at sea. So education on that is, is important. Um, with regard to the different organisations, 
yes, I think they, they, they can do things to help with welfare. They may start to incorporate um, welfare training into their, their training programs. Um, and that would be of benefit, of benefit to everyone going forward. And again, um, as we have uh, revalidation of certificates and certain courses, maybe that might be something that could be considered um, you know, as time goes by. OK, thank you very much, Ron. Uh, Tyrone. Um, Joanna, I think you have an opinion on industry collaboration and how it can be improved. Always. <laughs> can opinions. we hear it? <laughs> yeah. I do think that the Maritime Training Academies and the yacht managers and the ship managers and the NGOs do need to collaborate and work together. I think that the Maritime Training Academies could easily incorporate, for example, the ISWAN mental health, mental health awareness training into their uh, curriculum. Mm -hmm. I, I say easily, I'm not an education specialist, but I can't imagine it um, being an insurmountable task. Um, I just think, as kerry was saying earlier, um, it has to be a unified approach. Everyone has to be speaking the same language. Um, I don't mean uh, Portuguese. I mean, everyone has to use the same terminology um, so that every uh, cadet and crew member through their whole career receives uh, um, a very strong message that their well-being is very important and if their employer is not looking after their well-being there's another one that will. Um, in particular in yachting I think I would love to see the industry pushing the message for Yacht Crew Help which is the new platform which Ice One has very industriously produced for Yacht Crew to access in the event that they're in distress. Um, the message isn't going out, so I think that that would be a big start. In, the, in fact, the yachting industry have been fabulous through supporting Yacht Crew Help, but the message needs to get out much more effectively than it is. Yep. Fully agree. Thank you very much. Uh, Kerian, uh, Shell's perspective on collaboration, better N NGO um, support for initiatives, how do you feel? Yeah, I think I think that you, both Tyrone and, and Joanna have made really good points there, both from a education awareness um, from the get go perspective, um, making sure people recognise it as a valuable career um, and that we deliver on that um, through to public perception. I know Tyrone struggled with that in the early days of COVID um, and seafarers believed, well, finally, we're being recognised. But the reality is, I think Joe Public still isn't very clear on just exactly what seafarers do for them in their everyday life. Um, so we've, we've still a bit of a marketing issue to go here. Um, and I think uh, to Joanna's point about pulling the industry together, um, organizations like Together in Safety who are trying to do just that. They're trying to bring the intertanko together with the intercargo, with the flag states, with the commercial entities um, to really decide what will be our terminology going forward. Um, irrespective of your language and uh, you know how will we influence um, what's taking place at, a, at an industry level so that it eventually does roll up into IMO um, there's a lot of work obviously goes on in so many different areas that you know they need to happen but we need to bring it back to center to really um, push forward together and I think also we need to be cognizant of the commercial influence um, we have the best of intentions, but it's still a commercial entity. So, you know, it, it's a very fine balance that we need to manage to make sure that seafarers, for example, get access to, to, to Wi-Fi as they need it. Because the reality is if we don't work with the internet providers and there's a satellite down, for example, in, in Singapore, it's like trying to fill that free Wi-Fi through a hose pipe. Uh, and the seafarer is still complaining because he still can't communicate with home. He's still got uncertainty. Uh, and no control over his own destiny. So again, I think I've said it a number of times now, multifaceted approach, but working together, learning from each other. And uh, I'm excited to hear what the yachting group are doing. Um, uh, and we just need to share that best practice so that we all learn going forward. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks very much for that. Um, from my perspective, I've been involved in a number of NGOs, um, in particular SIGTO and Intermanager, most recently on the exec executive committee of both. And it's pretty clear that they both have NGO status in IMO. And if they have a common voice, then the, the strength of that voice will be heard more clearly at IMO level and change may be accelerated. I think we can do more, there's no doubt. Thank you very much. I'd like to bring in um, another uh, delegate question, another anonymous one, um, which links back 
to communication again. So we have, we have a fly around, <laughs> fly around the panel at the moment. Uh, Kerian's immune to it. <laughs> um, what, Wi-Fi is part of our lives at home and for people who work in normal jobs ashore. We expect it at sea if seafaring is to be a competitive industry. No Wi-Fi means being left behind and crew risk uh, being further disadvantaged and, and the job uh, unappealing. And I think that sort of reflects, again, what we predominantly discussed, actually. Seafarers need to have communi communication capability. Um, would anybody like to add any additional comment to that? Yeah, I would, I would add there's certainly a, an impact for um, all sorts of crew, but particularly in my specialism being yacht crew. Everything they do requires internet. If you're paying your bills at home, you have to have internet. If you want to submit your medical claims, you have to have internet. There's literally no way to cut. To and a lot of the yacht crew, in fact, are still working without rotation. So they're away from home for the majority of the year with no other way to manage their affairs other than on their phone. So it's a severe limitation to your life. Yeah, yeah. from a pragmatic perspective, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, there, but there was one element to crew welfare which we haven't touched upon, but what I think which NGOs can assist, and that is the, the propensity for criminalization of seafarers, which seems to be um, growing in certain regions of the world, yet remains largely unaddressed, it seems to me, um, at least in a, co co a, co a collaborative way and an assertive way from um, ship owners and operators who, who have basically responsibility looking after the crew. What's your feeling with that, maybe from a flag state perspective? Um, I'm not, I think, it's a difficult one to answer, David, to be honest. I think there is, there is some criminalization of seafarers for certain incidents. I think we've seen some high profile ones fairly recently. Um, however, that, that's the, the regulatory regime we currently work in. Master has overriding authority and all of those those statements within codes and conventions. I think that, you know, yes, there is difficulty with all of those things, but uh, and, until a suitable solution, and I think this will be the biggest problem that everyone can agree on is adopted, um, then, then we have what we have, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, I mean, MECN, an example of a, a shipping-wide collaboration that is driving out bribery and corruption mm. in the shipping industry. It's doing a remarkable That's job. A and, and therefore, I believe it is possible mm. to do the same with, with how seafarers are, are treated unfairly mm -hmm. uh, in certain circumstances. Certainly well. agree in the case of MACN, doing a fantastic mm. job around the world. Um, had several conversations with them in the last 18 months and hope to continue that relationship further in the future. Yeah, absolutely. OK, thanks. Um, I think now, do we go on to another anonymous Yep, thank you, Lee. Um, anonymous again. Um, the COVID pandemic has caused numerous problems for the reputation, uh, sorry, repatriation of seafarers back home, often with seafarers asked to, uh, or forced to stay on board much longer than their contract length. Um, what more can be done to assist seafarers? Basically to get home on time and not have overdue reliefs. Any ideas on that? Uh, can I start with Kerry on, on this one, please? I knew you would come to me first on that. And to be fair, I, I'm not actually directly involved in, in crew management any longer, but I, I'm very well aware of the work that went on with our crew managers um, to really lobby industry and the governments and authorities that they actually talk to each other. Um, it, it's not rocket science. If, if we have a certain set of parameters that we would like our seafarers to go home with and, and one country dedicates uh, one set of rules, then it, it, it's really counterintuitive that somebody else is in a position to, to dedicate something else. So uh, getting that consistency, getting behind the bodies who are actually able to make a difference and get governments talking. So for example, at IMO level, um, to actually insist that governments treat seafarers with respect because without them, world trade stops. Simple. And if you if you don't want that for your country, then we have to be talking and we have to be looking at how they can be dedicated, for example, as key workers um, to to have the rights to move around the world freely. Yeah, absolutely. I think there was a lot of pressure from a number of key industry bodies to 
get that key worker designation and succeeded in many cases. So um, there was traction there for sure. And I know through Intermanager, there was a huge effort from the, from the members of Intermanager, which, you know, there's some 50,000 seafarers are within that, um, within that cohort to share knowledge and information about where crew changes were successful, um, what tricks and tips they could utilize, um, sh sharing um, flights, chart flights, to, to make the, um, the trips affor affordable. It was a remarkable effort actually, and we, we saw the results of the reduction in overdue relief numbers very, very clearly, because we, we, we actually analyzed the statistics. Um, I was very, very proud of Intermanager for that because it's something they've achieved um, almost single-handedly, at least from a ship management perspective. Obviously, other um, other initiatives were were very valuable as well. Anyone not like to add on that? I mean, we've all seen the impact of it, um, and I do think, from a yachting perspective, if a country wants to have attract yachts and have a yachting industry and the benefits that that brings, then they should be treating the, the yacht crew as people that can easily get in and out of their country. For example, the, the number of Antipodean um, yacht crew is immense. And sorry, and the, it, it was so difficult at the beginning of the pandemic for crew members to get back to Australia and Africa and New Zealand. Um, and it didn't seem to be a priority for anyone. I knew of, um, crew members who had fallen pregnant and were unable to return home. Um, in fact, I, I know of several crew members personally who have decided to leave the industry because of it, because they couldn't return home for, to their families for emergencies and illnesses. So it is something they need to get their act together on for the next time. Absolutely, yeah. We, we should learn from, yes. from trial and error and, um, and build them into future procedures, uh, yeah. for sure. Okay, well, we'll go on now to the last panel question, um, and this is about what can governmental and legislative authorities do to support organisations to achieve better welfare? Um, we've touched on that to some degree and, and Cameron's answered that from an Isle of Man perspective. Um, so can I, can I maybe ask Kerry Ann to, to com comment on the uh, associated question to this, which is, 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 is it a fact that organisations like OCIMP, which Shell of course is um, a member, um, are actually driving how organisations deal with human factors um, ahead of IMO legislation. Okay, great, great question, there. and I'll, I'll be honest with you. Sorry, I was going to say, what I have in, in mind there is the, uh, the TMSA Chapter 14 Human Factor um, Chapter, which will be coming out, I believe, by the end of the year for uh, initial rollout. Um, what's your opinion? Indeed, uh, and a great question, but I'll be honest, it's it's not my area of expertise. I, I believe uh, Cameron's a lot more involved with this. What I do believe, though, is that if um, things are not legislated, if things do not get incorporated into guidance and guidelines, people won't get on board with it. So um, I, I, I agree that without the likes of OCIMP, uh, SIGTO uh, actually beginning to set the bar and get people on board with what we need to do and, and human factors, then it will never get as far as the IMO. So absolutely, they're a critical and very fundamental part of what, what the future looks like. Okay, thank you. Um, Kerry and teed you up for that, Cameron. Yeah. <laughs> very nicely. <laughs> <laughs> Much like Kerry and I'm not an expert on Ockham um, or TMSA Chapter 14. What I would say is that uh, the more bodies, internationally recognized bodies that you have, that implement good practice and guidelines, produce white papers, present them through to IMO, to places like that. That's, that is how you effect change eventually. Um, so um, I think it's, it's important, it's important work. It, you know, human factors, as we, we all know, are a contributing factor to all safety standards, really, these days. Incidents, accident investigations, casualty investigations, it's always taken into account. So fundamentally, um, we need to do more to address yeah. those issues. Okay. Um, there is another flag associated question I have with this, um, but it's not, it's not solely for flag. It also relates to other inspectors and surveyors, and that is whether or not people who go on board regularly um, outside of the shipping companies directly employ personnel like superintendents, mm. can they also be taught to look at human factors as part of their surveying um, process? 
So port state control inspectors, flag surveyors, class surveyors. Can, can there be a dynamic element to their inspection criteria, let's say, to look at the welfare issues on board? And I don't just mean the hard facts of hours of work and rest, for example, but m motivation, um, collaboration on board, how happy people are. It's, it's a very sub subjective um, subject, of course, but what, what's your view on that? I think there is a place for it, for flag state, certainly, for flag state uh, surveyors doing flag state inspections on board ships. I think it's something that we started to look at in the last 18 months, is to get our surveyors trained up to look for signs of um, people who aren't coping on board ship particularly well, be it that as groups on board ships or individuals, because quite often we've discovered in the past that it can be groups of individuals that are being more affected and have more mental health and well-being issues than other groups on board ships. And it doesn't always necessarily apply that the captain of the ship has better well-being and mental health than, uh, than the AB on board. So I think there is more we can do as flags. It is something that we're looking into. And we had a very kind offer uh, from one of the charitable organisations that does provide exactly that sort of training. So it's sort of a mental health awareness and well-being awareness recognition training. And we'll look to put our surveyors on those courses in the very near future. Um, I firmly believe that flag state has a responsibility in all of this. Um, hence, we, we produce the app. and. And hence, we'll look at how we can, we can help our companies to monitor their ships. You know, currently, we do two flag state inspections in five years. Um, that may change. We may end up doing more flag state inspections. And if that's the case, then we can be on board maybe supplementary as well to the owners being on board or superintendents being on board. And we'll get a lot more information about what life on board is actually like. Yeah. Okay. Um, just as a, f a final point on the panel questioning, we, d we did touch on empowering our, our, s our staff ashore, of course, equally important, but also our seafarers who are more remote and may, may find it more difficult to, to communicate their, uh, their particular issues. And we, we talked about speaking up channels, access to s service providers like is one. But what about empowering to the point of having authority to stop work? Now, it's something we've done in Burner Shilty Ship Management. Every seafarer has a card in his pocket. And if he feels uncomfortable about a process he's involved in, he's allowed to stop work, which we believe is empowering them. It's putting their safety in their own hands. Um, of course, we don't want it to be abused. And there's a risk of that happening through, um, through inexperience or ignorance of a particular situation. But over, overall, after several years of utilizing this, this authority, it's actually proven to be very powerful. And in fact, something like 25%, when, when we analyzed our near miss reports in 2020, 25% of them, and that's well over 1,000, were triggered by the use of a stop work card. Um, so we, we haven't realized the risks or, or the dangers that we, we f foresaw. Um, and I'll just get the opinion of maybe the ship operators, Kerry and to start with, on, on how they view that authority. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're, we're obviously an, an advocate for, for stop work. Uh, we would not want anybody to, to undertake a, a job that they felt was unsafe. Um, and it makes me reflect actually on something I thought during the Olympics where Simone Biles put her hand up and said, no, I'm, I'm not fit to do my job today. Um, and I think, you know, that's an interesting take on it. Would our seafarers feel comfortable and trust that we would support them equally well if they felt uh, mentally unwell? to stop the job as we would if they felt that a situation was technically unsafe. I throw that out as an open question because I, for one, am not convinced that that would be the case. Um, but hopefully, moving forward, we would get to a place where that is the case. Yeah, we're going to have to face that challenge at some point, that's for sure. Um, and as you say, I, I also hope that we will be open minded enough to accept that um, not feeling right for the job is is a perfectly good reason to to question whether it should be done or that individual's involvement should be there. Tyrone, do you have a, an opinion on that from the, yeah. the packet perspective? Um, again, we, we, we don't have the, the card per se, but we, you know, like every um, shipping company has, you'll have your risk assessments for a task. You'll have your permits to work, which must be carried out. And we do a, a toolbox talk with the people who are actually going to complete the task 
everything's explained to them. If they have any queries or issues or concerns, or at that stage, they can say, this is wrong, stop, and then it's all reassessed again. Reassessed, yeah. um, hopefully, whatever is wrong is fixed, or if it gets to a stage where it can't be done, it is deter uh, deferred or just cancelled, perhaps even until dry dock. Yep. But certainly, we, we do have that, um, that culture on board, and um, we would never wish to put any of our seafarers at, at risk. And the guys on board, they're well-trained, they're knowledgeable, and that they're not just going to say, because the officer says, do this, you will do it. It's not the case. In these situations, everybody's responsible for safety, and they all know about it. Good, excellent. That's uh, empowering seafarers. It, in it is, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Great, so that, that concludes the, the panel questions and also concludes the... Um, uh, delegate questions. Thank you very much for those. Um, made the conversation very interesting, I thought. So we come now to the uh, results of the poll question. Thanks for putting it on the screen, Lee. And the question was, what are your organisation's priorities for promoting seafarer well-being? And the number one answer with 60% um, of the vote was training and mentoring. Uh, second was Wi-Fi connectivity with 50%. Onboard catering and nutrition was 20%. Medical health insurance was 10% and family support was 10%, um, which is not exactly how I would have envisaged that result coming, but um, it's, it's comforting to know that training and mentoring is high up on the list. But I suspect that all those valuable initiatives actually will be considered by you know, proper, considerate uh, employers and, and ship operators. Thank you very much for that. So that closes the session, um, and I'd like to um, thank a few people. To start with the team at the uh, ELS studio here, fantastic technology, I'm very impressed. Um, first time I've done this sort of um, session, I have to say, and the result looks very good indeed. Um, uh, also, I'd like to thank Lee and his team, uh, Tyler Man Maritime, for driving our participation and making sure we actually contributed meaningfully and had some uh, pertinent questions to ask. Um, I'd like to thank the delegates and the contributors of the questions um, that add the vitality that we needed. And, and finally, and probably most importantly, I'd like to thank our panelists and Kerry and uh, remotely uh, for their valuable insight and for um, delivering data and information I think that the shipping companies in the, of the future can act upon in a meaningful way. Thank you very much indeed. Mm -hmm. And after that, I'd like to close the session. Thank you.